Let's pray. Heavenly Father, show us what a real king is. In Jesus' name, amen. It was 1985. I was in my second year at the seminary, meaning that the next year I was going on internship and the year after, my final year of school, and then the next year I was going to be a pastor somewhere. Still trying to figure out how to be a good husband. Uh, um, And now I was also trying to figure out how was I going to be a good pastor. Now there's a class every seminarian has to take. Three different professors offered it. A friend who was in his fourth year gave me some advice. He said, look, Professor A is easy. You'll get an A. It's guaranteed you'll almost do no work, but you're not going to learn anything. Professor B, perhaps the smartest person in the world on this particular subject. He is going to teach you so much. It is going to be amazing the amount of knowledge that you are going to accumulate, but you won't know what to do with it. Now, Professor C, a little unorthodox requires an awful lot both in and out of the classroom. Uh, He's going to push you in ways that you've never been pushed. You're going to be lucky to get a C or a B minus. But when you finish, you're going to know everything you need to know and more importantly, how to use it as a pastor. Welcome to the last Sunday in the church here, also known as Christ the King and Sunday of the Fulfillment. So what's so special about today? Well, the times we're living in are difficult. They're challenging and a little or a lot scary. But you know, 100 years ago, it really wasn't that much different. Spanish flu epidemic killed between an estimated 17 and 50 million people. There were a lot fewer people in the world. In other words, it had a huge impact on the entire globe. Ah, then don't forget you've got the rise of fascism in Spain and Italy, communism in Russia, anti-Semitism and Nazism in Germany, and secularism right here in the United States. As Solomon says, not much changes. So in other words, as we look around, we can see um, well, things just like that happening in our world a hundred years later. Church has been called and set apart by God to be the light in a very dark world. Remember that old Sunday school song? You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That song is very, very specific. We are not to put our light under a bushel. And then it gives that no with an exclamation point, and we always ask the kids to shout it. And yet because we are sinners and because we are a very forgetful people, Not only do we hide our light under a bushel, but sometimes we stick it in a bucket of water and extinguish it, and the darkness wins, which is what brings us back to this Sunday and why it's so important. Between the Great War, which was also called the War to End All Wars, which was neither great nor did it end all war, all those isms, as they came to power, they captured the imagination of Christians and churches around the world. Now, they shouldn't have, but they did. It's called manifest destiny, which is a polite way of saying that, you know, God wants us to fix everything in the world by you becoming just like us. And so some of the church helped break things instead of fix things. And for a while, the church helped the world get a lot darker. Now, Pope Pius XI wanted to refocus everybody back onto Jesus. And so he created Christ the King Sunday in 1925. The second to the final paragraph of his encyclical read with these words. Nations will be reminded by the annual celebration of this feast that not only private individuals but also rulers and princes are bound to give public honor and obedience to Christ. It will call to their minds the thought of the last judgment wherein Christ who has been cast out of public life, despised, neglected, and ignored will most severely avenge these insults. For his kingly dignity demands that the state should take account of the commandments of God and of Christian principles, both in making laws and in administering justice, and also in providing for the young a sound moral education. Some Lutherans adopted Christ the King Sunday in 1970s. Others kept it as the last Sunday of the church here, and still others as the Sunday of the fulfillment. But no matter which title you call it by, this is the last Sunday of the official church year. It's a New Year's Eve of sorts. Now, Christ the King Sunday presents a post-crucifixion, 
post-resurrection Jesus, glowing as our sun that rises with healing in his wings. Jesus stands against any and all who defy God's message of hope and eternity, yet just like the Pope was talking about. The nail holes still in his hands and feet, the gash where the soldier thrust his spear, they scream, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. Because death and hell can't touch him anymore if we are in Christ, then death and hell can't touch us anymore. So nanny, nanny, boo-boo, Satan. Well, Jesus declares without apology that he is the life that is the light for all people. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember, I'm pretty sure Clint Eastwood got both the look and the catchphrase for Dirty Harry from Jesus as he stands toe-to-toe against Satan and says, Go ahead, make my day. And the fear in Satan's eyes says it all. I mean, who wouldn't want a Jesus like that? But that is not the Jesus that we're given in our gospel lesson today. I mean, considering this is Christ the King Sunday, that's a very different gospel lesson. This Jesus is beaten, bloody, dying, and wearing a crown of thorn. He wobbles uh, before Pontius Pilate, who says, Are you really a king? And Jesus responds, Well, you say that I am. And Pilate finishes with, "Eh, What's truth? I know Pilate took this meeting seriously. His wife told him that she was warned in a dream not to have anything to do with this man. Uh, Pilate tried to send him off to King Herod, but when Jesus refused to do some parlor tricks, uh, Herod sent him right back to Pilate. Pilate tells the Jews, you know, I find nothing worthy of my time here. And the Jewish leaders say, well, then we're going to tattle to Caesar on you and make your life miserable. Pilate then offers to let either Jesus or Barabbas go free. Sure that the crowds are going to choose Jesus, problem solved, except for a reason he can't understand. The crowd demands that Barabbas be set free. What Pilate does not know is that this moment isn't about him. Now, his name is going to be passed down uh, through history every time we confess our faith and say, suffered under Pontius Pilate, but it's still not about him. He just happens to be the one on the earthly throne at the moment that the fullness of time comes to be. A real king, by the way, a real king, do you know what that means? I mean, have you ever wanted a king? Have you ever said, what we really need is a king? I mean, most of us have wanted to be king or queen, but that's a whole different matter. Do you even know what a king is? I, I mean, when Queen Elizabeth died, we were, we were told about all things kingly and queenly. The closest, though, most of us ever get to a king is a king-sized bed. Or, or maybe we go over and stay at the King Kamehameha Hotel in Kona. Or we visit Bishop Museum and see all the elite's feathered capes. A real king is not a president. Not a prime minister, not a czar, not even a crown prince. In fact, a king is not to be trifled with, for they wield ultimate power. They answer to no one except themselves. In 1 Samuel 8, the people known as God's people notice that their priest is getting old. In fact, so old that they know that it won't be long before he goes to be with God. They demand instead of another priest that Samuel anoint a king in his place. And that way they can be like all the other nations who have kings. Now, they had very specific qualifications. They said their king had to be tall, handsome, and strong. Now, Samuel told the people who were known as God's people that God was already their king. His name's God, and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They don't need a king. But the people who were known as God's people said, well, you know, that's nice. But we still want a king. And by the way, that tall, handsome, strong man over there, he should make the perfect king. So you better call Saul. And God told Samuel he wasn't going to change their mind. So Samuel showed up and he called Saul as their king. And the people who were formerly known as God's people became known as Saul's people. And it didn't work out so well. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was named after his father, who was, well, actually named after Martin Luther by his own choosing, in a paper he wrote called The Misuse of Prayer, he said, Never make prayer a substitute for work and intelligence. Never make prayer for anything which, if done, would injure somebody else. Don't pray for God to help you get even with your enemy. And never pray for God to change the fixed laws of the universe. Back to our text. Jesus has made himself a nuisance to the religious leaders. They want him gone so that they can get back to business and religion as usual. When their grand plans to discredit him fail, they decide he has to die. 
these all too holy and righteous people therefore accused Jesus of the following. Going to weddings and getting frustrated with his mom and then turning water into wine. Showing up at church and using a whip to clear the temple of vendors and bankers who were swindling the poor and the needy. Subverting the true church by talking to a Pharisee in the middle of the night about baptism, new life, and grace. Meeting a foreign woman in the noonday sun at the well and telling her she could be saved and that you don't have to worship God at the temple. He forgave a woman caught in adultery. He cried when his friend Lazarus died and then raised him from the dead. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the praises of the people, stripped down to his skivvies to wash the feet of his disciples. He healed people on the Sabbath, fed large crowds of people without a permit, walked on water, and allowed himself to be called, and I quote, Lamb of God, bread of life, good shepherd, light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, and the word. Oh, the inhumanity of it all. The temple police arrest Jesus, bring him before Pontius Pilate, who's on the emperor's payroll. Now they claim they aren't legally allowed to put him to death, which is why they need Pilate's help. Pilate is not interested in the internal squabbles of the Jewish religious leaders. He is, however, very interested in keeping his job. You see, uprisings are costly for Caesar, not to mention bad press and embarrassing. And so Pilate was told he would lose his job and maybe his life if he allowed one more uprising to take place. Yeah, so when Pilate asks what is truth, it's not rhetorical or philosophical. It's purely self preservation. Now, truth is more than just telling a story accurately, more than facts that can be verified on Google. When someone asks me what an ice cube is, well, it's water. It's vapor. It's a solid. In fact, it's actually all three at the exact same time. And because it is a lot of things, I can spin the answer to fit whatever I'm selling and still technically be telling the truth. So what is truth to you? I mean, each moment of your life reveals what you think is important in terms of other people. Yourself, time, money, and God. What would someone learn about your truth if they analyzed your credit card bills, your calendar, your health app, your garage, your work schedule, or your social media postings? I mean, we all have a king over our lives. We have a king over our money, over our time, over our body. We actually have a king over everything. The question is, who is that king? Have you ever noticed in all things religious, whether it's books or music or sermons or church services, we always start off talking about God and end up talking about ourselves? Even in worship, we find ourselves imitating Bette Mittler, who said, well, enough about you, let's talk about me. And then she followed it up with, but enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think of me? You know, as self-centered as it may seem, that is the theological truth that we need to hear. What does God think about us? Now, the purpose of Christ the King Sunday was to compel our hearts, minds, and lives to recognize and accept the reign of God over the earth, and specifically its people, which includes us. Pilate's questions echo through the centuries. Are you a king? Pope Pius XI rephrased it at, are you my king? With the question asked, Advent gives us four weeks to think about it before Jesus arrives on Christmas Day. Next Sunday begins a new church year. It's the first Sunday of Advent. And before Christmas became two months of shopping, ruled by reindeer, elves, presents, and parties, it was actually four weeks of fasting, quietness, and contemplation. Yet that went on for like 1,800 years. And people are always uncomfortable when it's too quiet and they have time to think about things that they actually don't want to think about. It's a lot easy to party and buy stuff. Now, thanks to Pope Pius XI, our church year ends with us challenged by Pilate's words. Are you a king? And what is truth? And if we're okay with Jesus being our king, what do you think that means for us? And Jesus' last name is not Christ. Christ act isn't actually a name. It's a title. It's Greek for the anointed one or the chosen one. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the chosen one or Jesus the anointed one. Think about all those things the Pharisees condemned Jesus for. Forgiving those who couldn't forgive themselves. Loving those who thought they were unlovable. Healing those who had been cast aside. Bringing those who were out on the fringes, usually pushed there by the church, back into the center. Madeline Lingle said, 
We do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to note the source of it. In Jesus' case, being what humans were designed by, by God to be is what got him killed. But I cannot help think what an amazing epitaph it would have been on his tomb. Killed because he loved the world far more than it loved itself. Except long before the stonemason showed up to carve anything on the tomb, Jesus wasn't dead anymore. It's called a resurrection. Yeah, it, we celebrated on Easter. He walked out of the grave alive and well and told the world and Satan and anyone else who would listen, this is truth. I wish it was as easy as Pope Pius XI thought it was. Just give the last Sunday of the church here a new title and everyone will stop and refocus on Jesus instead of themselves and life will be great again. You know what this Sunday offers us, though, is this opportunity to ask a few questions. Watch an amazing holy story play out in front of us. Discover where we fit into all of this. And more importantly, know what our truth can be in Jesus. It's not enough to just know that there is a king, you know, have all this head knowledge, which makes us very smart, but we don't know what to do with it. It's not enough for us to, well, just get through life without learning anything. Jesus calls you deeper into a relationship with the one who created you, who saved you, and who walks with you every single step of your life. Jesus, by the world's standards, is unorthodox, requires a lot, both in and out of the classroom, pushes us in ways we've never been pushed. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to get a B- minus or a C. We're going to fail the course. There is no doubt about it because none of us can be perfect as our God in heaven is imperfect. But when we are done... We will know what this life is all about, and more importantly, how to live it, because all we got to do is follow our king. And if we are willing to let him be king over our life, he promises that everything will work out because he values us more than a church or a people that just looks perfect on the outside but is rotten on the inside. And he says he will take our brokenness and failures unto himself, and that he will bring from them new life and endless possibilities because that is what a king, a real king does for his people. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you confess our faith now with me in the words of the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.